Deuteronomy is the final book in the Pentateuch, containing Moses' last sermons, as well as poetry regarding Israel's future. Moses pleads with Israel not to repeat their past mistakes, such as falling into idolatry. They must keep their covenants and keep the law given by Yahweh, or else they will lose the promised land. What does that mean for Latter-day Saints today? We'll discuss that and much more on today's episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the Public Communications Specialist of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Hill is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we discuss the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today we're joined by Dr. Avram Shannon, an assistant professor of ancient scripture here at BYU. Avram was educated at BYU, the University of Oxford, and The Ohio State University, and is a specialist in rabbinic Judaism, Jewish studies, and ancient biblical interpretation. Among his recent publications is the edited volume Covenant of Compassion, caring for the marginalized and disadvantaged in the Old Testament, published by the Religious Studies Center here at BYU. He is currently at work on an introduction to the Old Testament for Latter-day Saints with Dr. Joshua Sears. Welcome to the podcast, Afram. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. We are thrilled to have you here. If we could begin, could you tell us how you introduce Deuteronomy to your students? Sure. So when I talk about Deuteronomy to my students, one of the things I make very clear is in some ways, what we're getting is right there on the tin. Deuteronomy comes from Greek and it means, you know, second repetition of the law. And so in Deuteronomy, we've had Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. We've had these discussions of law, law code. Deuteronomy kind of does it all over again. And so we start with just saying, okay, guys, if we're going to do this again. That means there are going to be some distinctive elements here as we work through what's going on in Deuteronomy. The name just says it all for us as we start it. So I was struck that Robert Alter says that the book of Deuteronomy is the most sustained deployment of rhetoric in the Bible. And another commentator, Von Rad, calls it preached law. What is it that makes the book so rhetorically rich? So one of the things about Deuteronomy, again, as a sort of this repetition of the law, it's making an argument. It tells the story, the end of the 40 years in the wilderness, Moses gets up on the mountain and says, OK, Israel, let's talk. Let's do this again. We're going to go through this. And so this idea of repeating the law means that Deuteronomy is telling the stories and it's doing so in a way that it's got one point of how laws to be lived on who God is. It's making a point about his relationship to God. I mean, we see sort of similarities in the points in various points in the Old Testament. But Deuteronomy from start to finish is the product of a single view on our relationship with God. And that makes it distinctive in Scripture, where we oftentimes will get multiple voices and things coming in as we read um, the various scriptural books. Yeah. Deuteronomy begins with a recap of Israel's history to a new generation of Israel, sort of like when you're watching a season of television. The second one, it recaps what happened in the first. How does Deuteronomy use history to reach its audience? Deuteronomy is, again, it's a book where, where this notion of law, for all of the Bible, but especially for Deuteronomy, law is fundamentally about Israel's relationship with Jehovah with Israel's relationship with, with Yahweh and who he is and what he does and how the Lord interacts with them. It's going to start with, and we see this, talk a little bit more about this perhaps, we see this in terms of its connections with sort of ancient covenant-making procedures, things like that, that are kind of all through Deuteronomy. It's got this historical prologue where God says, look, look at all the great things I did for you. You know, I took you out of Egypt. I took you, you know, I brought you here. And it says, and here's what you're going to do for me. And then it kind of looks forward and says, and look at all the great things I'm going to do for you. And so Deuteronomy's view of history is both backwards looking in the sense that it shows Jehovah's covenant relationship with Israel, but it's also forward looking in the sense that if Israel keeps it up, then things will still be good. But in this also seems to be in Deuteronomy, if Israel doesn't, then things are going to go bad. And of course, that becomes to be significant as the Bible reaches its final form of composition, because things indeed go bad. Reminds me of Moroni's promise here, at kind of another historian saying, before you do anything new with God, remember all the things in the past that kind of happened with God. So this recapitulation becomes kind of vital soul preparation. Absolutely. You can even feed that in with something in, say, when Nephi talks about the purpose of Scripture is to expand your memory, this idea that you've got to place your current relationship in connection 
with the other relationship and the previous relationships with God. So as you worked through and taught Deuteronomy and studied it and, and looked at it in your own research, do you feel that there's a, a particular spiritual worldview that's being articulated in this book, a particular theology, or to see it have a particular special interest in social justice, for example? Yeah, so Deuteronomy certainly focuses on, on some very key things. One, Deuteronomy is, of all of certainly legal books, the most focused on this notion of Jehovah alone. We call it monotheism. That's, of course, an anachronistic term for what's going on in Deuteronomy. But this focus on you only worship, Israel's only relationship is with Jehovah. And all this other stuff is not for Israel. Now, Deuteronomy still allows and says, yeah, you know, if they want to worship other gods, that's fine. You know, God gave, actually, it actually said in one place, God actually gave them those gods. They can worship them. But Israel, you don't. The covenant relationship is, as Deuteronomy frames it, an exclusive covenant relationship. And because of that, Deuteronomy will use marriage language. God loves Israel. Israel loves God. It will use these kinds of very, very focused views on that. And then it, with that, it includes things like Deuteronomy is very convinced. It says that there's one place you worship. And so one of the major themes is the centralization practices, centralization of the temple ordinances in one place. The place of which God will put his name is the Deuteronomistic phrase for that. And so a lot of the reforms, and so it's got all these laws about what you're not supposed to do, about Canaanite religion. Again, not that those are necessarily bad for them as such, but if Israel does them, that's going to be a real issue. And so there's a lot of, and again, there's a lot of boundary maintenance here. One of the things we see as we read the Bible is that many of the practices forbidden by Deuteronomy seem to be okay in other places. For example, Deuteronomy forbids the setting up of standing stones, um, Hebrew matzibot. But when Jacob goes to Bethel, you know, he has his dream, he sees God, you know, it steps into heaven, the whole thing, they take its ladder, and the first thing he does, he sets up a standing stone, pours the oil on it, says, this is Jehovah's house. And so you find that Deuteronomy is so concerned with this strict covenant relationship that even things that previously were okay are no longer okay in Deuteronomy's perspective. The notion of social justice is intriguing because the whole law is concerned with it. Deuteronomy does have places, and this has been common argument scholarship, that it's more concerned with it. It does have a lot that talks about widows and orphans. Part of that is it has a lot, because of some of the things reforms makes to the temple, now Levites and priests outside of the center place are protected persons. And they're going to be one of the major audiences of Deuteronomy. So there seems a sense that part of the emphasis there is when you're an out-of-work priest, suddenly the concern for out-of-work priests becomes more important. But there actually is this focus on you take care of the poor, widows, orphans. This is something that to live God's law, to be God's covenant people, you cannot leave the people on the margins. Thinking also about how when I tell a story, even sometimes to the same audience, I'm going to have a little bit of a different frame or a different inflection. Is there a unique view or a different way of seeing the law as taught in Deuteronomy? Certainly singular in the sense that, so Deuteronomy is, as I think about the various law codes in the Bible, you've, you've got Exodus, you've got Leviticus, and as you read them, you'll notice that they don't always agree. The great example of this is the slave laws. Exodus in Exodus 20 and 21 says, you have a slave, after seven years, you let them go. They want to stay. You, you know, you can let them go without anything. They, they go free, but you don't give them any gifts or anything like that. Leviticus actually says you can't make Israelites into slaves, but it's a legal fiction. You can make them into indentured servants who serve for seven years. It's the same thing, but the ideology in Leviticus is a little bit different. Deuteronomy is very close related to the law in Exodus. You have a slight slave, they serve for seven years, you let them go. But then it says, but you give them gifts. They do not go out empty handed. You set them up after you let them go, which reflects something of what we talked about in terms of the social justice idea, this idea that you take care of the slaves even after they're no longer your slaves. And, but when I think about these kind of differences in Deuteronomy, in particular just in general, I kind of think of it as what we have in the Old Testament is sort of like seeing different layers of the handbook of instructions side by side, where if you read the handbook of instructions or its equivalent from the 1960s, the 1980s, and even, you know, the early 2000s, which you can actually you can still get the legacy edition and the um, current edition on the Gospel Library app and compare them. You see, there are lots of things that are the same. There are lots of things 
that are different. And that kind of comparison. So in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy's view of law, I mean, it's all part of this covenant relationship in all the places. But for Deuteronomy, it's that singularity of purpose that really makes Deuteronomy's view of what Torah is, of what God's law, what that covenant relationship is. It's, it's this, this single-mindedness towards Jehovah. You've given us a really great sense of kind of what's in Deuteronomy. Be useful to kind of reflect back on the kind of context of Deuteronomy, perhaps how it how it kind of fits into the ancient world. Some scholars have suggested, for example, that there's a relationship between Deuteronomy and wisdom literature. So what's the literary context of Deuteronomy in the ancient world? Again, the context connection to wisdom literature, we see actually several genres showing up in, as part of the Kabbalah's Deuteronomy. This is part of the sustained rhetoric we talked about earlier. We see, for example, this notion that, one, it's law code. And so it has connections to other ancient Near Eastern law code. These are things you do, you know, thou shalt not, and thou shalt, these kinds of commandments we see that are frankly just laws at that point. We see connections to treaties. We talk about covenant and this idea of, of Israel as covenant. In the ancient world, the covenant form is often found in these vassal suzerain treaties where a king says, again, look everything I've done for you. Look what I'm doing for you right now. This is what you do. These are the stipulations you do. And in return for that, I'll protect you. I'll give you good things. If you don't do that, I'll destroy you utterly. And you find that in Deuteronomy, the exact same thing. God said, look what I've done for you. Here's our relationship we're setting up. If you do the right things, then I'll protect you. If not, I will destroy you utterly. But we also see elements, and this, I think, really relates to this notion of the social justice. Wisdom literature is very much concerned of humanity's role in sort of the world. What do humans do? How do humans interact? How do we interact with God? What do we do with this kind of thing? Very pragmatic in that sense. And especially vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Leviticus or Exodus, some scholars have suggested it's almost humanistic. That's, again, an anachronism, of course. But this idea, this, this focus on lived religion right now is a major theme in, in Deuteronomy. Again, you see that even in chapter the Shema, you know, he says, you know, here is in this great theological, the Lord, the Lord is one. And he says, and I want you to talk about this. When you go to bed, when you get up, teach your kid. The notion of didactic, teaching your children is a huge part of wisdom literature. So you have these, this, this law, this treaty, and then that didactic nature, and you teach this to your kids. Some scholars have connected the final form of Deuteronomy that we have now with the period of Josiah's reforms of Israel's cultic practices as described in 2 Kings 22 and 23 and 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. How is Deuteronomy reframing Israelite worship? Okay, great. But this notion of this idea of suddenly there is one place you worship. There is one kind of centralizing emphasis. is used right, And, and that's going to change everything. Because, again, you read Exodus, and Exodus says, you know, Exodus 20, the altar law. Anywhere you want to build an altar, you build an altar. Anywhere you think that, you know, read Genesis. I didn't even know God was in this place, Jacob says. And, he, you know, he builds an altar. He builds a place there. And, of course, those sacred places remain important. Bethel becomes where Jeroboam I builds one of his national shrines when Israel and Judah split. So the centralizing focus, this focus that everything, you've got to come to Jerusalem. And we'll say mixed view of kings. Right? It says you get a king, but you can be a king, but you've got to be a certain kind of king. And, of course, no king we've seen in kings is like that. But Josiah seems to be trying to be like that. You also see your formulation in things like prophets. Deuteronomy 18, the rule of the prophet says, if any prophet says anything about the future and it doesn't come true, that's a false prophet and you kill them. I mean, honestly, the function of that law is to basically stifle prophecy. That, that's what it does. And so even though Deuteronomy likes prophets, it's kind of saying, we've got to control this. And in a lot of ways, a lot of the sense of Deuteronomy is things were wild and woolly before. Let's try and bring them down. Let's try and sort of put a bow around it. And that seems to reflect, again, Deuteronomy in its original formulation seems to be older than Josiah. Again, I say seem there because there's lots of discussion there as we talk about it. It certainly reflects elements that predate the monarchy even. We, we can see elements in Deuteronomy that go all the way back. It also reflects elements that, you know, in sort of spinal formulation, reflecting this kind of Josianic reform. And really part of the reflection seems to be these are the troubles that Israel are facing now that suddenly they're thrust on the world stage. When you're a bunch of tribal chieftains living by yourself in the middle of nowhere, as you see in Judges or early, early Samuel, David and Saul are kings. I mean, you know, they're really jumped up bandit chieftains in terms of how we would see them in warlords is kind of the best kind of comparison that you get in early Israel. 
But now they've got, they're centralizing, the new Assyrian Empire is exuding huge cultural influence on there. And suddenly the question becomes, how do we stay Israel when we have all of this stuff around us? And Deuteronomy seems to reflect a lot of those things in, in its final formulation, these kind of questions of this is how we stay faithful to Jehovah now that these things have sort of thrust on the world stage. Thanks. That's really kind of wonderful insights. I think bringing this, the richness of this book get much more clear for us as we consider it and as we look at it. It feels like Deuteronomy has an outsized influence on Scripture more sort of broadly. One of the ways is it seems to shape the next few historical books, the former prophets in the sort of Jewish canon, Joshua through Kings. Why is that? What's going on there? Really what's going on there is it looks like it's actually being shaped by the same kinds of people who are concerned with what's in Deuteronomy. So our major historical record, again, this Joshua, Judges, not Ruth, but not separate them, but Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Samuel, Kings, Kings. Again, as scholars, we would call that the Deuteronomistic history, because it's our earlier question. We talked about the lens of history. We know we're talking about this is what happened before. This is what's going to happen. Basically, Joshua through Kings is at least redacted, but probably composed by people who are viewing their history through the theological lens of Deuteronomy. It's worth noting, of course, as we think about the history of the Hebrew Bible composition, Hebrew is not a language until about 1000 BC, right? We don't even see Hebrew as a language until roughly around the time of King David. And so we don't see literary productions. Again, we know they're writing. We know they're certainly doing things orally. There's so much of this oral stuff that's going on. But we don't see these kinds of literary productions happening until fairly late in sort of biblical history, right around Josiah, these kind of, we start seeing, you know, again, the same thing, you know, we see prophets like Elijah and Elisha, they don't write anything. We get into the 8th century, the 7th century, and suddenly people like Hosea, well, Hosea seems one of our earliest prophets, suddenly they start writing things down. This idea of literature sort of comes into Israelite history. We see earlier things like in the Restoration Scripture, things like the Book of Moses says that they're, they're writing things, but really the, the starting writing of history in Israel happens right about the same time as we see the rise of the Deuteronomists in terms of their influence on Israelite thinking. And so what this means then is that the story they tell us, the story we have, is largely Deuteronomistic. Now we know, we know they have earlier sources. Like, like Mormon, we see evidences of sources and redaction. Again, the same way that Mormon takes from Alma and the large plates and kind of weaves it together. And Mormon's point is, this book's about Jesus, remember your covenants. And so he'll pick things that say, remember your covenants, this book's, and think about Jesus, right? We know, we don't know. We're pretty sure that Alma wrote lots of stuff, but Mormon's going to pick those things that really focus on his message of Jesus Christ. In the same way, we know that there are other versions of Israelite history. We know in part of that because something like Chronicles, we have another version of it, but it actually takes DTRH and rewrites it. So we know this is happening in the ancient world, we just get to see it. And so this is kind of the version that goes forth. Again, king books, there's some, some chronicles, some royal chronicles, things like that. And then they kind of give them a direct perspective, which is you've got to worship God in the right way. And if you don't, bad things are going to happen. We, again, you know, we, we talked earlier about the history of you, bad things are coming. The final redaction of DTRH happens at the very beginning of the Babylon exile. So in some ways, what we're seeing in Joshua through Kings is them looking back and saying, how did we get here? What happened? And they frame it in terms of not keeping the covenants as laid out in Deuteronomy. Like I just said, because it's sort of framed in terms of, you know, it sort of comes together and is really promulgated. Again, we, we know it has much earlier stuff in there going back to the various ways of living the Sinai covenant. This is the version of the law that we find as Israel really begins to write. It's all through Jeremiah. Jeremiah uses, I mean, Deuteronomistic language throughout. It's all through find places of it in parts of Isaiah, especially sort of the latter parts, the Book of Consolation, Isaiah 40 and following, right? We see a lot of Deuteronomistic language there. Hosea looks like the other way around. Hosea seems to be informing Deuteronomy and the final formulation of it as much as the other way around. This is, this is kind of the prophetic voice that then says, we need to do something with this. When the Israelites come back from Babylon, sort of the Persian period, so we get things like Chronicles. Chronicles is Persian. So there are, other, there are other notions for this. This explanation of why this happened because we didn't worship Jehovah properly basically carries the day. And so suddenly this becomes the matrix through which the returning exiles understand their relationship, understand the rebuilding of the temple, understand everything that moves forward afterwards. This notion that, oh, we messed up serving Jehovah properly. We've got to figure out how to do that. And that question, how to do this properly, 
when it pushes the Bible forward and it pushes into early Judaism, it becomes really, really important. How do we make sure this never happens again? Which is it's kind of the message DTRH, right? DTRH is here's why they did, here's why it happened, and and here's how we're going. Sorry, DTRH is a way of saying Deuteronomistic history. It's, it makes it a little bit shorter. I think I mentioned that previously, but then it does. I mean, when Jesus quotes the devil, he quotes Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is, in fact, one of the most quoted books in the New Testament period. In fact, the three most quoted books in the New Testament are Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. So when they're, when they're quoting law in New Testament times, they're quoting Deuteronomy. And there are a number of reasons for this. One is because recapitulation of the whole thing. It's nice and compact in how it frames things. But two, as I said, it, it kind of carries the day in terms of how Israel and then how later Judaism thinks about their relationship, their covenant relationship with Jehovah, thinks about what the temple is, how the temple works. I mean, you know, the famous verse, you know, hero Israel, the Lord is one. This becomes kind of the foundational statement in Judaism. And that, that's Deuteronomy. You know, when they ask Jesus, What's the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, and he had mind and strength. He kind of modifies it a little bit there, but he's quoting Deuteronomy right there. And then quotes Leviticus, which shows that there's, these other laws are still, they're still in part of their scripture. But it's Deuteronomy and this notion of loving God with all your heart, might, and strength that really carries the day. This is his scripture, right? We, when Jesus reads scripture, he's reading what we would call the Old Testament. And the most important scripture in the Old Testament from an ancient perspective, is the law. And Deuteronomy is kind of, Litovic is the other most important, but those are for different reasons in there, depending on whether focusing on purity laws or focusing on the kind of things that Deuteronomy focuses on. The Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which was approved by the First Presidency when it was published, states that Latter-day Saint scriptures are replete with Deuteronomy teachings. How do you use Deuteronomy to help teach the Book of Mormon? That's a really great question. And of course, Deuteronomy kind of placed in its final redaction is right in uh, the Josianic reforms, right in the reign of um, King Josiah, which is within Father Lehi's memory. This is still very much an ongoing conversation. The Nephi's memory, depending on when you want to date, how old he is, we don't know that. But again, you know, the king's just before Zedekiah. So this Deuteronomistic reform, these Deuteronomistic questions are very much on the minds of the Lehites as they leave Jerusalem, as they leave holding. Some people suggested, eh, the evidence goes one way or the other, but some have suggested that part of the difficulty between Laman and Lemuel, because again, they say these people are righteous, they keep the law, the right, so that Laman and Lemuel were Deuteronomistic, and Nephi and Lehi were not. Again, the evidence is not strong there, but it, it is suggestive, perhaps, you know, the very first thing we see Lehi do, you know, he travels three days out and he builds an altar. And so there does seem to be some sense that Lehi does not feel beholden to this notion of one place. When Nephi goes to the promised land, the first thing he does is he builds a temple. Nephi seems to be not beholden to Deuteronomistic understandings. Well, that's really, I mean, and Lemuel is actually where the problem is. It's very clear that they're not beholden. On the other hand, and this is where things get fun, on the other hand, this notion of if you keep my commandments, you'll prosper in the land. That's the Deuteronomic proposition. That's the whole thing the law is saying, you know, so I see, see what I did. Here's what I'm doing. You do what's good. I'll give you good things. Not you'll be cut off. And so and so Book of Mormon theology is framed around Deuteronomic proposition. Keep my commandments, you'll prosper in the land. And so and so again, previous Book of Mormon scholarship has seen actually a lot of Deuteronomy. David Seeley over in, uh, in my department, BYU, has done some really good work describing this. Again, in my own scholarship, there are other sources that kind of work their way into it in terms of what's going on there. But definitely Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy's understanding of law is in the air as the Book of Mormon starts. And that seems to feed into certainly Nephi's understanding, although again, specific propositions, Nephi and Lehi are free to disagree with. This is distinctive. But, but even again, this notion of how you deal with not being in the land, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is part of the question that Jacob has to ask. How are you Israel when you're not on Israel? Again, even as they're responding to it, they have to respond to this notion of what does the land mean? What's land theology? It's the Book of Mormon, even when it's disagreeing with Deuteronomy, is still responding to Deuteronomy. So valuable. I think all throughout work on the Old Testament and this podcast so, so far, part of the message has been the Old Testament informs everything we're reading in the New Testament, everything we're reading in the Book of Mormon, everything we're reading in the Doctrine and Covenants even. This is the kind of foundation of our scriptural literacy, and the kind of big ideas are just flowing through, being worked out, either in response to or following. And so it's a 
just a reminder that the Old Testament is a good place to to begin <laughs> all of our study of Scripture. And that kind of brings us to this kind of last questions that we'd love to to ask you, and that is sort of what do we do with Deuteronomy as Latter Day Saints? How have we kind of looked at it as Latter Day Saints, and how can we apply it and think about it and and sort of learn from it in our own studies and our own lives today? That's a really good question. It's always the question with, I love what you said about this notion of the Old Testament being foundational to Latter-day Saint thought, Latter-day Saints, you know, again, our scripture is all built around it. Again, it's worth noting, I mean, the Old Testament's an old book. And so sometimes you're going to read things and you're going to be like, ha, huh, what do we do with it? Like, this relates to our notion talked previously about this idea of Deuteronomy as, as a book of social justice. And sometimes you're like, really? Having slaves and this is particularly just? So... Part of it is just remembering it's an old book and not trying to make it do things it's not trying to do. That's always, I think, for any of the Old Testament, don't try and make it do something it's not trying to do. Don't turn it into a 21st century book. And actually with that, I think something that's really key is this notion of, of likening. I often ask my students this. I'll say, how is an apple like an apple? And they'll kind of stare at me for a second and say, why are you being weird, Dr. Shea? You know, I'll through this. And eventually a student will say, an apple's not like an apple. It, it is an apple. And I say, exactly. When you liken things, you're acknowledging that they're different. You don't liken things that are the same. And so when we liken scriptures to ourselves, the first thing we're doing is acknowledging that they're different. And so I think that's a huge part of it. But I really think for Deuteronomy and for how it informs what we're doing and how we're, how we're thinking through it, one is take those ethical things and just run with them. God meant it when he says, take care of widows and orphans. He meant it when he said, can't actually be my people unless you take care of all my people. He meant it. And we need to, we need to be serious about that. We need to be intentional about that. Again, Deuteronomy is a great example of the likening. We don't have to do it the way Deuteronomy says to do it. But we probably shouldn't do it the way Deuteronomy says to do it. We're, we're totally different in social circumstances. But that suggests to us that there's more than a way to do what God wants us to to have done. The other thing I think that's so important with Deuteronomy is, again, it's right there after the, you know, the Shema, which is, you know, the hero Israel. It could be in Shema Israel, so that our Jewish friends will call that, that verse, they call it the Shema, part of one of their prayers. As I said, it says, when you've, when you've done this, talk about it. You put it on your house. You put it on your arms. You put it on your forehead. You, you talk when you, when you go to bed. You talk when you get up. You talk when you go out. You talk when you come in. This idea that, that scripture and God's commandments and how we take care of each other and how we live this commandment is something that we should be doing all the time. And that's just something I love about Deuteronomy, this notion of, you know, you go out and say, hey, look at this cool thing. You come and look at this. The, 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 the idea of God's covenant and God's covenant relationship with Israel is always there with you. And for me, that's one of the great things that Deuteronomy has to teach us. I think that's a great place for us to stop today. Thanks so much, Avram, for joining us. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media at, at BYU Maxwell, on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu.edu. Thank you, and have a great week.